Howdy, folks, and welcome back to another special edition of Dead Pit Radio. I'm the Creepy Kentuckian. And I'm Uncle Bill, and how's everybody doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing peachy keen, Uncle Bill, because we have a very special guest on the show. We do. Tonight. With, uh, you know, if you're if you're a fan of Dead Pit, you've checked our show out for the last 16, 17 years that we've been doing it. You know that we've interviewed plenty of people from the Friday the 13th franchise, but this is a first. We have never spoken with Lauren Marie Taylor from Friday the 13th Part 2. She was also in John Belushi movie Neighbors and Mm -hmm. Girls Night Out, which a lot of people are big fans of that one as well. We're going to have her on here in a little bit to discuss those movies, and she's got her own podcast and everything coming up, so it's going to be fun, right? Yeah. I mean, we're not going to just focus on uh, Friday 13 Part 2 because I feel like that that, you know, that's a part of her career, but there's some other like movies with some other backstories that are really interesting that, you know, we'll talk about as well as as the Friday movie. But uh, it's a big deal for us because it's one of the few interviews that we've done in the past year, two years, you know, at this point. Yeah, we don't do them very often. Uh, Uh, Scheduling and stuff like that usually is not the easiest to set up anymore. But uh, it's a fun interview, but I did need to let everybody know there are some technical issues with uh, her internet, believe it or not. It was not ours, I don't think, this time. It was hers. No, I don't think ours. <laughs> um, mine because she mine li- actually seemed okay. <laughs> she lives in the, you know, it sounds like she lives in a rural area right now, too. So there was a little bit of technical issues with her internet going in and out. We did try to edit it as best we can. Um, so... Yeah, just be aware that there probably are some cutouts and stuff like that from time to time. But it is a great interview. I think it, it everybody had fun uh, with it, and she's a very, very sweet lady. And um, she's very, uh, very down to earth. It seems like a very entertaining and has some good stories. And that's like the best thing that you can ask for in a podcast guest. And also, you know, she has her own podcast, uh, which she says she talks about in this, but. Um, she's interviewed some pretty interesting people too. Like some people that I wouldn't mind, you know, interviewing at some point. Yeah. So we'll see, but I want to kick it to the interview guys. Hope you enjoy and keep it creepy over at deadpit.com. Yeah. The first interview we've done in a while. We used to do interviews all the time, almost every week on the show. Uh We've had a lot of people from the Friday, the 13th series and the, the second one, actually, too. I was thinking back. We've had all kinds of people from the first two movies. Really? So it's good to get you on. Yeah, I mean, we were um, we were pretty close with Steve Dash back in the day. Uh-huh. Um, and he was one of probably the funniest interviews that we ever had was with him. So we have fond memories of that. And uh, Adrian King, we spoke with her, Amy Steele. So it's good to get you on because I don't know if you were doing conventions around that time period when we were doing those uh, interviews I don't know and stuff. How long ago were you doing those interviews? Um, we started doing the show in 2005, 2006. Okay. That yeah. Was I like, was not, yeah. Yeah. That was our original radio show that we were doing. So we kind of made a return about three years ago and aren't doing as many interviews now or anything. But, uh, you know, over the years, I mean, it's like, because this is kind of a series that we've grown up with as kids and into, you know, middle age now i guess <laughs> so, um, thanks <laughs> making me feel old real quick <laughs> but uh, uh everybody's getting older so but yeah i mean we appreciate you taking the time out and speaking with us and everything oh sure it's great it's a great day sunday i don't know if there's any baseball going on but for fans out there this we're doing this on a sunday i'm not sure when you'll get to listen to it or see it cool So we're going to go ahead and get started, though. I guess the first question, just tell us a little bit about your background and what led up to you getting into acting and filmmaking and stuff like that. Okie doke. Yeah. I mean, um, I grew up a little shy girl in the Bronx, in the tough Bronx when it was tough. So there was not a whole lot of starstruck type of business in my eyes growing up. It wasn't until I got into high school where to get out of my shy shell my brother said, oh, you know what? They need a girl to stand and get burned at the stake in our school play. And it was an all boys school next to my school, you know, at his high school. And I was like, oh, I don't want to do it. He goes, come on, you'll meet guys and you'll meet people and they'll be good for you. So I did this little walk on where I get burned at the stake 
And the rest is history. I just kept doing shows. That I started auditioning for the shows because I thought this is really kind of fun because I was not myself. I got to be somebody else all through high school. So I found out I was able to sing. So I would do a lot of the musicals and have the leads in musicals. And it wasn't until I did a production of Oklahoma with Ali Sheedy, who was my brother's girlfriend at the time, her manager came to see her in the show, came up to me afterwards and said, have you ever thought about doing TV commercials? And I said, not particularly. And she said, well, why don't you give it a little, you know, a little try and see what happens. You got summer off. So I was like, yeah, sure. All right. I have a nanny gig, but I'll just bring the kid to the uh, auditions. And lo and behold, my first gig was a three-year contract to do all the on-camera and jingles for the Burger King commercials for the Who's Got the Best Darn Burger in the Whole Wide World campaign. So that's how that's how that started my professional career. I went to college for a little while, but I was working so much I had to, you know, take time away from college. So I did that. And I went to acting school, to theater school. It was called Circle in the Square. It was part of NYU at the time. This is going back to 1980, something like that. Yeah, 1980s. Yeah, 1980, not 1980s. It was 1980. And um, while I was there, I got the uh, call to audition for Friday the 13th. And the casting director was someone who had put me in, you know, I don't know, hundreds, not hundreds of commercials. I've done hundreds of commercials, but uh, she had cast me in several campaigns that she had worked on and she remembered me and when they were looking for somebody sweet and all american good old catholic school girl and they called me in and i got the part almost immediately i'm curious like at that time what was uh what was friday the 13th like in terms of like how was it perceived around that area because there'd only been one and it wasn't like the Friday the 13th that we know now with the hockey mask and Jason, he wasn't really even a big part of it or anything. Like how was that movie kind of looked at at that time? Well, you know, it was after Halloween, right? Halloween was the one that started the new face of horror instead of horror being just about devils and ghosts and haunted house, you know, horror became about a serial killer, you know, that somebody knew, but nobody knew. So when Friday the 13th came out, I mean, they started the process of part two right on the heels of Friday the 13th, you know, breaking box office records for its genre for that time. I was not aware of it because like I said, I was busy doing commercials. I was trying to get through that, that college year and everything. So when I was casting it, it was right when I was finishing up my time at Circle in the Square when I started it. So I was completely unaware of anything. I didn't mean, I, I don't know, the last movie I had seen before being forced to see Friday the 13th was Star Wars, I think. That's how busy yeah. I was as a young, uh, as in, you know, in my late teens, I guess I should say. Um, so, uh, so because most of us had not seen it, before we went up for filming, they made us, made us, they made us, they sat us down, they strapped us to the chair, and they made us watch part one, which was not even part one. It was just Friday the 13th. And I remember coming home and saying, I, I, I've i never seen those actors before. I wonder if they really kill people in these movies. And I was scared to go because I thought I was getting myself into a snuff film because, you know, <laughs> you grew up in the Bronx, you think everybody's out to kill you. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Yeah, time, times were different then, too. Do you remember the, the audition process, though? How many people were there? Was it like a professional audition? Did you? Oh, yeah. Okay, it didn't throw any red flags up or anything. Like, this is a little, you know. <laughs> no, no. And I, I think it's because I knew the casting director. I think that's why I didn't have any red flags. If it was some creepy looking guy in a hotel room with a couch behind him, I would have been like, mm, maybe I should not go into this into this gig. But this was at a, a regular, a lot of the places where you audition, you know, they were, you know, like offices in a way, but offices or bottoms of brownstones in lower Manhattan that were set up like mini studios. So you'd go into, you know, this is a small room, actually. That's why I moved everything down here. But you go into a regular size room and it doesn't look like a living room, let's say, or a great room. 
But what it has is it's got, you know, the cameras and it's got lighting equipment and it's got microphones. And it was, it was very professional. It was very typical of the audition process. It wasn't like when you audition for a TV show, the audition starts in the office, then it goes to like a rehearsal type of room, and then you get screen tested on the actual studio floor with live sets. With the movies, with Friday, it was just a regular audition in a room with a camera and you know the casting director reading the lines opposite me, reading Mark's lines opposite me. And that was pretty much it. That was the that was the only audition I had for it. Neighbors was different, but for that one, it was, yeah, but it was very professional. Yeah. Now the, um, I think this was a little later in the series. You knew what you're auditioning for, right? It didn't have like an assumed name, which I know later sequels, you know, they, some of the cast didn't know exactly what movie they were, <laughs> they were auditioning for. Oh, we knew we were doing a sequel to Friday the 13th, but the working title, because it's when you really see him, you know, as the sackhead for the first time, and he's actively stalking everybody. The movie was called Jason. So on the cover of our script, it read Jason. Hmm. Yeah. Cool. So, yeah, but yeah. we did know we didn't, there was no secrecy. We knew that it was, you know, going to be a part two. One of the great things I heard about this too, and you can kind of confirm this or deny it, or, but is that with this movie, they actually had you guys living at this camp like yeah. for a period of time, which is yeah. a great idea, but a horrible idea at the same time. But Well, yeah. for, for a city girl, you know, growing up in the Bronx, I mean, you know, we used to sleep on the fire escapes because the apartment was so hot. So, I mean, I was kind of used to living in an environment that was not particularly comfortable or glamorous by any means uh but to sleep at a camp when you're from the city you know you live in the city and there's constant noise either people screaming or honkings of horns and fire engines and police cars you get up in the woods and it there's nothing it's quiet it's dark i was scared i was scared to death i i, I don't want to curse but i was scared when they called me when my manager said hey lauren you booked it pack your bags you're going to camp I was like, wait, we're going to sleep at the camp? And she said, well, yeah, you know, it, you know, they're not going to put you in a hotel room. There's, there are no hotels in the middle of nowhere. I said, oh, and I thought, okay. And I thought it would be like, dum -de dum you know, air conditioning and comfy beds. And we had cots and screens in the window that were broken where the mosquitoes could come in and, you know, mess hall food. Oh, but it was fun. It was a great bonding experience for all the actors to, to sleep like that. Now, for you, you were one of the youngest in the whole cast of that that movie, right? There may may have been one or two that was around your age. How did the cast all get along? Was it kind of like a friendly atmosphere, or were there? Because I know later on there was an issue with uh, with the guys that played Jason. I'll just say that we'll talk about that here in a little bit. But like at the time. What yeah, I mean, um, Warrington and I are within a couple of years of each other, um, even though he wasn't my my Jason for my scene, but he was always hanging around because he was the one that they did the mold for. Um, you know, Bill Randolph um, and I think John Fury, they were the oldest of the bunch. When I say oldest, I mean like four or five years older than the rest of us. Um, but I think Marta and Kirsten were the youngest. Then it was me. And the guys, yeah. And the background actresses, they were all young too, but I think they were all around 20. But the guys were all in their 20s already. Yeah. And Amy, I think, had a, she was maybe two years older than I am. I'm not sure. I, I'm, I'm not sure offhand. But yeah, we were definitely Kirsten and Marta and I were the youngest. Marta, of course, being the youngest, which everybody still talks about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it was not, it was, it didn't affect our relationships at all. You know, we were all in the same boat and we were all experiencing the same thing. And, you know, Steve Miner was smart to start with the campfire scene when we were filming too, because it gave us that instant camaraderie, you know? So he did all the group scenes early on. He didn't do the movie in sequence except towards the end, uh, but he did do all the group scenes uh, with everybody, you know, early on and then, those of us that were getting killed were kind of left over at the camp. <laughs> yeah, I got you. You had a lot of scenes with um, 
Tom McBride mm-hmm. in the film as well. Like, how was that? I mean, in, in terms of how was he to work with, in terms of like how was he offset, you know, things like that too. Well, Tom was really a serious actor type, actually. He was a very actor's actor. You know, he loved the whole craft, the whole character, getting into character. I had known Tom since our my commercial days, which were only a couple of years before that, because I'd only been doing commercials for a couple of years before getting the movie. So Tom and I knew each other from the commercial circuit because they would put us together as a couple, even though he was a few years older than me. They liked the way we looked together. So it was interesting that when it came to casting, because the casting director had been a commercial casting director, she knew us from the New York scene and she just knew to put us together. And he was very easygoing. He was, you know, he wasn't particularly a prankster like some of the other ones were, but he was very easygoing. I mean, I have photographs in my album of him just, just hanging out, you know, um, you know, just, he was, yeah, he was cool. I didn't, I mean, I, I knew he was gay, but of course, when you're that young, you think, oh, you know, that's a temporary um, uh, state of being because, you know, it was, you know, late 70 or, you know, 1980. And of course, I, I would flirt with him nonstop. And finally, he said to me, he goes, Lauren, how long have we known each other? And I said, I know, but you can't blame the girl for trying. Right. <laughs> that's great. So Steve Miner, though, who is the director, this was his directorial debut in part mm-hmm. two. I mean, he'd done, I guess he'd assistant direct producer and stuff like that before with other movies, but what were your impressions on him? Because he was really young still at the time as well. And not really that experienced as far as just, you know, being the sole director of a movie. Yeah. He was very focused. I I was almost afraid of him actually in a, in a little bit of a way because he ran a very tight, tight ship. You know, he was friendly. Don't get me wrong. He was friendly with everyone but not that sort of yucking it up type of friendly that sometimes you'll get with a director. Um, yeah, well, that's a, that's that's another story. But I was on a soap opera for 12 years and because I was on a soap opera for 12 years, the yuck it up relationship became something between the crew and the actors because you're with each other for so long. With Steve Miner and then with other movies too, because you have a limited budget and you're given X amount of time to get the job done, and Steve being a first time director, he had to prove himself. So he ran a very tight ship. He was very focused. There wasn't a whole lot of joking going around and and he was good. You know, he kept us on schedule. If he said, we're starting as soon as the sun sets, I'll be damned. That camera was ready to roll as soon as the sun set. So he was very good like that, very organized and athletic. He used to play tennis with one of the producers all the time. And John Fury, I think. Yeah. Hmm. So about your character, though, I mean, there's been a lot of talk and you probably constantly, you know, heard this, but your character is one of the most sympathetic characters of probably any of the films. And it kind of makes the the whole like demise of that character even more just, I don't know, uncomfortable to watch yeah. <laughs> like, because yeah. it's so... I. Uh, it's hard to explain, but I'm sure people have brought this up to you that the way that they went about your death scene and everything in that film was just very, it's prolonged and yeah. it's, it's very uncomfortable. I more so than like somebody gets their head whacked off or something like that. <laughs> you don't see <laughs> a whole amazing. lot. Yeah. Yeah. It happens. But it, yeah. For everybody else, it happened instantly. You know, there was yeah. no long way, but you know, she's standing there, she's seeing her friends, you know, one hanging out behind her covered with blood, the other one still in the bed, even though you don't see it, still in the bed next to Jason, dead, impaled. And then you got this thing coming at you. And a lot of people, what I get from a lot of people is, why didn't you just run? And I'm like, well, the door was closed behind me, number one. Number two, the poor chick was like, what the F is going on here? Right. You know, she's yeah. complete yeah. shock. You know, I mean, you know, I thought about that when I first moved up to the up to where I live now, which is in the middle of nowhere, very quiet at night. I thought about it um, when I was outside one day and I was, again, I'm a city girl. So moving here the first couple of years, I was creeped out. I heard a sound in the woods and I know it's not because I heard a horror movie, but I was so scared. I froze. I mean, I, 
I thought about screaming. I couldn't scream. I, I was walking the dog that we had at the time, Max. I thought about running with Max and I, I my legs wouldn't move. And I'm thinking, mm -hmm. that's how Vicky was. Mm -hmm. She couldn't move. She was so fearful. Yeah. Yeah. yeah fight, fight, flight, or freeze, they say. So you're either going to do one of those three things usually. Yeah. And right. I totally, totally froze. Yeah. Sorry. I got cat hair flying around me. <laughs> well, and that was the, the first shot too, where you actually see, and we've always referred to this Jason as tater sack, Jason, <laughs> you actually see him, you know, which Steve dash. I remember he was like, it's, it's a pillowcase, not a potato sack, you know, so, <laughs> yeah. um, but I always called him tater sack, Jason, but like, that's the thing that I like so much about part two is it's kind of in between, you know, it's before the hockey mask. So things are a little bit more interesting and the formula I don't think was there yet to what it would become in later movies and everything. But like, what did you think of the look of the killers kind of a backwoods, just, you know, <laughs> sadistic killer. Yeah. I mean, I thought it, he rocked those uh, overalls for sure. I mean, I never looked at overalls and plaid shirts the same ever again. You know, yeah, I, yeah. I yeah, there was a time, I think there was a year where overalls came back and everybody's wearing overalls and it was after I'd done the movie. I'm like, I ain't wearing they're, overalls. They're still popular down yeah, here. They've never went away here. <laughs> they've never like, lived. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is still a no. fashion trend here. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. But it, it is kind of cool. I mean, the makeup that they did on Warrington, that Carl Fullerton did on Warrington Gillette was excellent. I was there. I actually have a picture of it somewhere behind me. I don't know if you can see it or not. Um, that yep. it was, uh, it, it was great makeup. I wish the, we had seen more of that instead of just the jumping through the window. Um, but my Jason was not Steve Dash. It was not Warrington Gillette. It was, uh, Jerry Wallace who was part of the crew and he's the one who had the sack head on and he's the one who came out with the knife and, and he's the one who dragged me down the stairs too. <laughs> so but I had my own Jason. The climax of the movie and towards the end, and I think, and I don't, you probably, I don't know if you were around during the filming of this, if you saw it at you know, the initial time in a theater or whatever, but I think the climax and the end scene in this is probably the best in the whole series, right? Um, yeah, I, what, I, I love it. Mm -hmm. Pardon me? Just oh. what were your initial impressions, like the first time you saw it? Did you go to the premiere for it, or was there a I premiere? I don't think so. It wasn't... You know, movies now are so different. Everybody fusses so much about everything. And back then, we didn't fuss about anything. We didn't have, I mean, we all, I know uh, somebody went to see it at a drive-in. Somebody else uh, saw it in their hometown. I'm, I think I waited for it to come on cable. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I saw it in the movie theater. I think it was a double feature with a rerun of Misery or something like that. Um, anyway, that's not true. Anyway, um, uh, I did see it in the movie and I, I think I saw it by myself because I didn't want anybody to see it with me. I was I was just so amazed at how great the fight was. But yeah, to clarify, I really thought uh, Amy did a great job. I thought Steve Miner, the cinematographer, I thought they all did a great job in the editing room and really keeping the suspense. Hey, I <laughs> we hear that kitten. Yeah, and the sense of everything going, you know, it's a black cat. What can I say? But I really thought they did a great job overall. That was a great, I, I, I do think Muffin lived. I don't think that was a hallucination. I think Muffin lived. Yes, me too. I hope so. I like to think that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the um, one thing that I, me and uh, Aaron have always wondered about, and there's a couple of extra characters that don't really have speaking roles in it. And of course, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that that's in every Friday the 13th movie. Yeah. But, uh, Stu Charno's character, what was his name? I've got it here. Uh, Ted. Ted. I think. Yeah. The, he just stays at the bar. He never, like, the, they never brought Ted back for a sequel or anything. He's like one of the only, that or he died off screen. I mean, what do you think happened with Ted? Um, I think uh, it's one of two things. <laughs> Either he married the woman behind the bar and just <laughs> became a townie, or he uh, died um, from hitting his head in a drunken stupor. But I have to ask you about this because this is fascinating to me in like every possible way. So the same year that this movie comes out, you do a movie called Neighbors, <laughs> which is kind of notorious for uh, 
being like one of the most production riddled kind of movies that it has ever come out like the chaos that was supposedly behind the scenes on that movie where did you and hear I'm, that well there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff on these different sites that talk about not not that there was like you know there's supposed to be a lot of arguing between some of the actors and the director and then a lot of arguing between the director and some of the producers and like a lot of back and forth a lot of script rewrites a lot of things like that and you can kind of see that in the movie. Like it seems like it goes like 15 different directions. I don't know what your experience was on this movie, but I've got to know. Like, <laughs> well, I do have a few stories that I I tend to only disclose the one that I was seriously a part of and privy to. The other ones are just kind of like, ooh, that happened. Um, so yeah. we were doing the big dinner scene. Um, I mean, I had a great time on that movie, by the way fantastic time i sometimes i call it like the best professional experience of my life because it was just a roaring fantastic time for a young young woman young actress so we're doing the dinner scene and um everybody's there so it's um uh Aykroyd, belushi um Catherine walker me kathy moriarty and the camera's at the head of the table and you know john belushi is doing the whole you know, spiel during dinner. And the director, John Alvinson, had won an Academy Award for directing Rocky, the original Rocky. Yep. So he was not known as a director of dark comedy. God rest his soul. He's no longer with us. Um, but he was a good director. And he was had a very strong personality. So he kept telling Belushi to be funnier. And he kept saying, John, that's just not funny. And this had been going on and it was a hot day on set. We had gone over by, I don't know, six weeks or something like that. And it was a hot day and everybody's sweating. Kathy Moriarty's makeup was melting off of her. We had to reshoot her part of the scene because her mascara was like melting. So that said, Belushi was starting to get irritated because he was very hot. And John Albertson just pushed it one too many times to tell him to do the scene funnier. But he's... Am I allowed to curse? Yeah, go for oh, it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So Belushi, you know, bangs his, you know, his, his his stuff on the table, and he looks at Albertson, and he said, why don't you just get your goddamn Academy Award and put it on top of the fucking camera so we know who the fuck you are? Bangs both hands on the table, stands up, walks off set, and Dan Aykroyd just sat back and said, well, I guess that's a wrap for the day. <laughs> <laughs> wow and Kathy Moriarty looks like a Cheshire cat and she just sat there and just you know smiled and stuck her tongue out a little bit and Catherine Walker was just like I'm good with that and I was like we go to Dunkin Donuts and off we went to Dunkin Donuts <laughs> but so, it, I mean it was a good time what was there to your knowledge I mean was there a contentious kind of relationship between them the director and, and Belushi and Aykroyd I mean, Aykroyd, you know, it's funny because uh, Aykroyd, you know, he's tall and, you know, hoping guy, uh, great guy. Uh, um, sorry, my cat just climbed up our screen of the window. I'm sorry. He, he's really insane, this kitten. Um, you know, Danny was, he was really relaxed and he was sort of the one who calmed everybody down. Mm -hmm. You know, Catherine Walker would go off and, you know, she was, you know, people smoked a lot back then. So she would go off and smoke. Kathy Moriarty, um, her husband slash manager was usually on set. So she would go off with him and I would just kind of be the odd person and just kind of hang around the trailer and just experience all this. So Danny was more of a, um, he was more of a laid back, like, you know, let's take it easy. Let's calm down. Let's get Dunkin' Donuts and happy munchies. Let's go get Dunkin' Donuts. You know, John was very, um, as much as he was a really funny guy, he was very serious about his work and, he wanted to make it work. He wanted to make this movie work. And it was hard to do because he wasn't getting the support, I guess, he needed from the director. And I think he wanted to change aspects of the script. And the person who had written the script was very well known. And, you know, that wasn't happening. Writers have big egos too, you know? Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, that movie, though, over the years, I mean, become kind of a, a cult movie, really, as well, just in a different genre. It's, 
it was Belushi's last movie. So, I mean, this was yeah. what, just a few months later is when he, I guess, overdosed or whatever happened there. Were you yeah. surprised when you heard that or could you tell that there was something maybe going on on the set? Um, I was a little bit surprised. I mean, you know, you know, pot is not a horrible thing. I don't smoke it myself. Um, but I do not think that smoking weed is horrible. And, you know, back then it was this thing, you know, on, um, you know, you know, some of the uh, people smoked pot and whatnot, usually not when you were working, but, you know, to relax and chill out. Um, around me, he never did any heavy types of drugs that I would think he would overdose on. He never, ever, the most he did in front of me was smoke pot, the most. We were, we were at a meatloaf concert, a private meatloaf concert you know, in, um, in a, a little club. And that this was, you know, early 80s, you know, it was 1981. And, you know, uh, cocaine was really big. I never saw any of that go on. He just didn't do it in front of me if he did do it. Um, so I was surprised because I know that he was really working on himself when we were filming Neighbors. And I know he was working on becoming healthier so I was a little taken aback that it had gone because when it does go downhill, you know, you go, you get into a place where, you know, every day is a new day and make every day count and one day at a time. But when you come to a place where you fall off of that, it's a very steep fall. And I think that that's probably what happened. He there were influences around him that were not in on the same page that he wanted to be on. You know, it's it crazy sad. how how young he was at the time too, because he was what in his early thirties. Yeah, I think it's 33, 34. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. It was crazy. And you know, people call you and they want to know things. And I was just like, I I was not gonna gossip. You know, I'm not telling things that I knew about that went on behind the scenes on set and whatnot, disagreements, petty arguments, things like that. I wasn't going to talk about that because I didn't want to be rude to his wife, to Judy, because um, she was always so kind to me and always welcomed me into her home. And Okay, real quick, I got to ask you this too. So in that in that film, your character goes through a pretty dramatic like arc from the beginning <laughs> to the end, right? So you go from yeah. being like the all-American, you know, girl to like the punk thing. Was that Belushi? Because I know he was really into like punk. Was that his kind of like? Oh, it was, dude, it was all Belushi. All of it. Yeah. When, um, I mean, I was so happy. I mean, I got that role by default. I didn't even really audition for it. I was doing a, sh a show that I had been understudying off Broadway called Album, Album with Funny Enough, Kevin Bacon, and we never talked about our Friday movies because they had all just degrees. come out. Isn't that crazy? Degrees. I mean, yeah. degrees. Some degree. degrees of Kevin Bacon. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, I had to go to Chicago to take over for Jennifer Grey, who had fallen on her head and got a concussion on her birthday. So they flew me out to Chicago for a couple of weeks to take over for her while she recovered because we had the same role. I was doing that one in New York as the understudy. And she was doing it in Chicago at the Circle Square Theater in Chicago, funny enough. So I came back and my manager called and she said, can you get over to this uh, address? It's not far from where you live. They're looking for somebody to play John Belushi's daughter in a movie. And I said, who? Because I didn't watch Saturday Night Live. And she hmm. said, well, it's the, the funny guy from Saturday Night Live, you know, Animal House. I, I, oh, OK, I got you. So I went over there and they're all sitting at a table and I walk in, you know, and they said, well, where have you been? And I said, I was in Chicago and I told them the same story. And they're like, well, do, did you go to this club? I said, of course I went to that club. Everybody goes to that club when they're in Chicago. You know, so when we just started talking and they're like, okay, great, thank you. And I went, okay. I didn't read any script or anything like that. So I went back to my apartment, old school, phone rings. She said, Lauren, get back over there. And I said, what do you mean? They said, they really liked your personality. And I said, okay, but they didn't have me read. And she said, what? I said, they didn't have me read. And she said, well, that's news to me because they want to see you because they want you for the part. I said, but I didn't read. So I went back, sat around the table, and Belushi goes, you know, 
he was supposed to play your father. But I decided I wanted to be the father. I want to be the father. So we switched roles. And I said, that's great. He goes, do you have a bathing suit? I went, oh, shit. I said, yeah, why? He goes, well, we need to have a picture of you. Mind you, I still hadn't read the script yet. He goes, I need to have a picture of you because there's a point in the, in the script where where um, so-and-so, uh, the character Kathy Moriarty play, plays, picks it up and goes, oh, is this your girlfriend? And I was like, no, I, I have a bathing suit. Yeah, I can wear it. Next day, I was in a bathing suit get on, in a photo session for that one picture. And I was like, okay, <laughs> this is weird. I never read for this part. So, you know, I go in again and we said, he, everybody passed around the scripts. Everybody was there. And they're like, all right, let's do a read through. And I'm like, this is when they're going to take the part away from me. This is when they say, oh, this girl, no, forget this. So anyway, so obviously I, I had the part and they called me up and they go, um, you have to go for your wardrobe fitting. So I was like, okay. And they said, well, go to this address. Again, I'm like, if this had been like a Dateline NBC, it would be like, <laughs> she was told to go to this address because she was trusting. But she was a tough girl from the Bronx. So I'm a tough girl from the Bronx. And I figure, oh, I can't handle this. So I go to the address and it's this punk, you know, cool shop down in the East Village. And there's Belushi and Ackroyd waiting for me. And it was like, you know, a scene from Pretty Woman where we just went from shop to shop, trying on clothes, trying on all kinds of things. Then we went into a, a hairstylist and he did the whole thing with the hair. And he's like, yeah, yeah, let's take a Polaroid. That's what I want. That's what I want. He basically dressed me for the shoot. He dressed yeah. me. And then there was the dress. And it was like, it has to be a sweet, innocent dress. What do you have at home? You have anything at home? Bring something from home. I'm like, well, no, not really. I'm kind of a tomboy these days. So they got the dress and it was kind of cool. So yeah, that was really fun. It was, it was, it was like a little, a little fantasy, you know? And then we went out of the costume. I, <laughs> I was gonna ask, like, at that time of your life, were you more like the punk or were you more like the, the um, straight kind of, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was the straight yeah. girl. Dude, you can't go through 12 years of Catholic school. <laughs> you just true, can't. Yeah. Oh my God. No. I mean, I was not the rebellious girl at all. I no, no. <laughs> were, were you surprised though that like what the remake came out about three or four years ago when you saw that that was, cause they've remade all kinds of stuff, but for a movie like that, that's pretty much care. Like it's those guys really. I mean, that's, that's a tough one for anybody to try to try again. I would think. I mean, I thought the remake was, uh, was, it, it wasn't really a remake. It was more, it was called neighbors, but I thought the premise was more, living next to a fraternity or something yeah, like that. So yeah, it's a little bit different. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't I, see I it. never did see it. I didn't know it. So oh okay. uh, I yeah, that, I, didn't, I didn't see it. In some ways like movies like the Burbs are closer to that movie. Like yeah. I mean that's a pretty close kind of take of that movie except you know the neighbors are killers. But other than that, like <laughs> it's the same kind of thing. Now uh there was a return to the horror genre, though, shortly after with, uh, and this is a movie that I just recently saw. I think Arrow <laughs> came out with a Blu-ray of it. Yeah, Girls Not Out from, I think, 1982. Yeah. And there were a yeah. lot of slasher movies coming out in the early to mid-80s. Um, any memories or recollections on this one? Because the killer in this one is is pretty interesting, to say the least. A Girls Night Out, right? Mm. <laughs> um yeah, yeah what about girls not out interesting well, killer that. yeah that's that's the thing yeah. yeah interesting killer i love the blue i mean i have the uh i have the old um vhs here up there and i've got the blu-ray of course i thought that was they did a really nice job um you know we did the um the commentary of course you know or interviews i think they're called we did that um and that was kind of fun but it, 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 it was it was weird because it was it was on the heels of neighbors and I was kind of like wait we're doing another slasher you know I, I thought it was just a, kind of a weird move from neighbors I was hoping you know to catapult into what I wanted to do which was a soap opera I always wanted to do a soap opera um I know it's a weird career hashtag bear goal but that's why I, I grew up you know grew up I grew up watching my grandmother watch them so that when I did fall into acting I was like I really want to do that. I really, really want to be in people's living rooms every day, annoying them. Mm -hmm. So um, that hadn't happened yet. So this, you know, again, you're a young actor, 
you just, you take jobs as they come. And again, I was still doing commercials and that one came and I thought, oh my God, when I read the script, I got, okay, this looks like it's going to be really fun. And it was so much fun to make between the cheerleading scenes and then the party scene and the whole dressing up thing and getting killed again, except with a lot more blood. I look back on that fondly. At first I hid from it, but now that I've watched it again with the Blu-ray that came out, um, you know, the and all that, my husband and I watched it again and we're like, this is actually kind of fun. I wish they would put this on Shutter because it's a fun movie. It is, yeah. Yeah, and I met There's my a- husband on the set of that movie. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he played Bostwick, the geeky guy, Ralph Bostwick. Are you um, serious? Guy, yeah, he played the guy with the glasses and the beanie. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's and my husband. I've been married to him for 40 years. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And is that where yeah. you first met him? Yeah, that's where I met oh, him. God. Yeah, he always tells a fun story about <laughs> seeing me at, at commercial auditions. And, you know, I mean, I always feel really weird because I think he said this during the uh, interview. It's like, you know, Lauren would walk into a room and it was like this ray of sunshine and everybody like gravitated to her and i wish she had just looked at me once and i was like i like will you stop saying that <laughs> but he <laughs> says that and i don't know if he means it or not but yeah that's where we met for the first time yeah that's amazing so, i know awesome. that's awesome um with the friday the 13th series though and everything pretty much like coming full circle like at what point in time did you realize that hey there's a gigantic fan base for this series and start doing these conventions and seeing just tattoos and people dressing up and everything like for yeah. us coming out of eastern kentucky just seeing it and not even being a part of the series it's unbelievable you know i just wanted to get your your thoughts on that and reuniting with the cast at shows and stuff from time to time yeah it's it is kind of weird because i was not aware of the whole convention circuit you know like i said i was on a soap opera for 12 years I had all three children while I was on the soap opera. So I was a busy person in my late 20s and up to being around 40 years old. Very busy, you know. And then I went back to school, you know, and whatnot. And I was walking around in the city, in New York City one day. And my daughter was in an acting program. My youngest was in an acting program. And so this is somewhere in the 2000s, like 2010 or 2009, something like that. And I get a call from Warrington Gillette. He goes, hey, Lauren. I go, yeah. He goes, it's Warrington Gillette. I said, oh, shit, how are you doing? You know, because we were very friendly. And then we lost touch. You know, I got married. We lost touch. He goes, I'm doing great. What are you doing right now? And I said, well, I'm, you know, in the city waiting for my daughter's acting program to be over. I have a couple hours to kill. So I'm just walking around. He goes, come on over. It was some hotel on 34th Street or something like that. Get on over here, the Penn Hotel. Come up to the second floor and look for me. And I said, well, what the hell are you doing there? He goes, well, don't you know, we do these conventions and, you know, the fans come and meet us and you sign autographs. It's a great gig. So I was like, ah, all right, I'll go up. So I went up and I started hanging out with him. He goes, did you bring pictures? And I said, no, I didn't bring pictures. Why would I bring my headshots? He goes, no, from the movie. I had no idea what he was talking about. So that's the moment I found out about conventions. So Warrington came the following year, calls up. Hey, Lauren. I said, all right, I'm coming, I'm coming. So I brought my old headshots with me. Well, people were coming with posters. So he shared his table with me, which people don't do. But he shared his table with me. A couple of the other Jasons were there. It was in the New York Comic Con. A couple of the other Jasons were there who I'd never met, but they were there. And... um. I had a great time. I was the only girl there. It was great. And then uh, a few years later, I got um, someone got in touch with me, my current convention agent. I met her at one of the conventions that I was at with Warrington. And I had only gone to, I think, two or three. And she said, oh, do you have represent- representation? I said, for what? I have an agent. And she goes, no, conventions. And I was like, is that a thing? <laughs> it's I hard to believe that that is, but it is. Yeah, a, lots of money for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think my biggest convention year when I really started getting out there was probably 2014 or 2015. Mm-hmm. I was still teaching, so it must have been 2015 
when during the summer when I would have off, I would say I'm available. And then once in a blue moon during the school year, they'd say, oh, can you go to Monster Mania? It's local, you know, or can you go to Chiller? It's local. It's within driving distance for you. Because as a teacher, you know, you take off, the kids are behind a month, you know, I take off two days, they're behind a month. So I was like, well, if it's within driving distance, I can go. So I would take my sick day on that Friday so that I would be at the convention all three days. And I would never tell the admin where I was because, you know, you get X amount of sick days and I was never sick. So finally, I think one of my last years of teaching, one of the other teachers came up to me and she goes, I have to ask you a question because I have my married name. I didn't use my maiden name. I didn't use Taylor. So I said, what's your question? She goes, well, my brother is a huge horror fan. And inside I just went, oh shit, the cat is out of the bag. <laughs> so the cat was officially out of the bag. And when I left, when I retired from teaching, I said in my exit interview, I said, by the way, all those sick days on Fridays that I would take, <laughs> they went, yeah. I said, I was at a convention. <laughs> at these conventions, I'm curious, like yeah. what is, what is the thing that you get asked the most often? Oh God. If I still have the brown undies. I knew that was going to be it for some reason. <laughs> like I knew that was going to be it. <laughs> they wanna know, yeah. They want to know if I still have the brown undies. And they also want to know why I didn't run, of course. And then why did I change from the black into the brown undies? So there's a little bit of obsession that goes on with that. Why did you change? The black ones were perfectly nice. I was like, because Steve Viner picked out the brown ones. I asked him for red, but it was a no-go. Well, brown was <laughs> a popular color in 1981, right? It Maybe. must have been, let me tell yeah. you. <laughs> oh, my God. It and I know fun. that... Um, you know, you're doing the conventions now. You have a website and everything, and you're doing a podcast as well. Oh, yeah. In interviewing a lot of people in the genre and friends and stuff like that. Have you kind of warmed up a little bit to, like, the movies? Are you watching the movies anymore now, or is it kind of like, eh, I was in a movie. You know, I, I appreciate you guys, but uh, we'll just talk about old times. I mean, I'm just curious. Um. Well, what I what I do is – I, if it's somebody from my franchise, I'll go and I'll rewatch it because I have seen, you know, a lot of them, not all of them, but I have a few favorites that I've seen. Part six is one of my favorites. Um, so, you know, I'll always go and I'll watch the movies before I have somebody on the podcast. Like um, I'd never seen Sleepaway Camp and I was interviewing Catherine Kami very early on, I think the first season of the podcast. So I had to watch Sleepaway Camp. And then of course I book a gig where, I'm in a, a drive-in and they're showing a double feature of Sleepaway and part two. So I got to see it twice in the span of, um, you know, a couple of weeks. So then I interviewed Felicity. So, you know, you make a point of watching, like, you know, when I had Leah Ayers on, I watched The Burning, you know, so you make a point of watching, like I have a couple of people from Slumber Party and, you know, Evil Dead. And it's like, I, it, some of those movies are hard to find, but I, I, I make a point of watching them and I'll watch other work of theirs Wait, that we have Lee. more to talk about. So you, you interviewed Lee Ayers? Uh-huh. Did you talk about Bloodsport? Please tell me. We you did a little bit, yeah. Oh, yeah, we did a little That's bit. That's like yeah. one of his favorites. Movie. I'm sorry, really? but I would just love to know any like story back you know, behind the scenes of that movie. <laughs> uh, like that. Okay. That's a movie that will be <laughs> yeah. ripe for stories like that. Yeah, yeah. I, I wish I'd known because then I could have said, oh, you know, my you know, my friend Aaron wants to know blah, 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 blah. <laughs> <laughs> there is a book that just recently came out. If I'm mm -hmm. not mistaken, it's called Sackhead. I yeah, believe that's Sackhead. the name of the book. Yeah, The Ultimate Retrospective on Friday the 13th, Part 2. Yeah, it's written by Ron Gann, and I had him on the podcast. Um, and I've known Ron for, a, I don't know, a couple of years now, so it was like a no-brainer to have him on, especially since he wrote a book about my part of the franchise. And it's a good book. He goes into great detail. Um, a lot of the backstory, you know, the history of the characters, the backstory of the characters, stories about the actors and, you know, just firsthand accounts that he's had with all of us. And it's it's a good book. It's a very easy. And of course, before I had him on, I had every book. And even though I, you know, I mean, but then I'm like, oh, I didn't know that. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. So it was, it's a good read. It's a very quick read. And yeah, yeah, it's, it's a good book. I recommend yeah, it. I'm gonna, 
I'm going to buy this book. I had not known about it until I was like, you know, doing research and things and found out that that was so, yeah, it just recently came out too, I believe. So. Yeah. Yeah. He yeah. was in, um, um, yeah, he was in I think, towards the end of season two. My podcast is kind of in a holding pattern right now though, with the actors strike because we're, um, I can't really interview actors about their projects. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like yeah. I have a um, couple of people lined up to talk to and two of them have movies that are coming out which is why you know i want you can't to really talk that. about those right 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 so it's i'm kind of in a bit of a dicey place right now with it i'm hoping it'll be over by september because these guys have movies coming out late september early october and i'd really like to get the info out there. So I'm doing for August, I'm doing something called creator month. So I'm talking to um, young director slash writers about their process and, you know, and everything that goes into doing an independent full length movie. So that's, that'll be kind of cool. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, we appreciate you taking the time out with us today for oh, yeah. sure. Um, and you've got the one appearance coming up in Huntington, West Virginia. We definitely wanted to mention that again, coming up in the fall, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so if people if people go to laurenmarietaylor.com, there's a little section that says, I think it says appearances now, not conventions. And I actually have the link on the O River to that appearance. But uh, Ron Milky, Officer Dorf from Part One, will be there with me. So we're actually taking a road trip. I'm driving him there. Yeah. So that'll be kind of cool. But yeah, that's pretty much it. And you know, again, with the actors' strike, the convention scene is kind of weird too because technically you're not allowed to bring your own pictures from movies. You're allowed to sign stuff that people bring to you, but you can't do panels, and you're not supposed to bring your own movie still pictures. So it's it's a little bit, a little bit weird right now out there for all of yeah, us. I, yeah, that's I wondered about that, like how that would affect conventions, but that makes sense, I guess. I mean, with all the yeah. well, the the big one, the San Diego Comic Con, I'm sure it pretty much destroyed that one, right? Yes. Yeah. Did you go to the website? No. I went I, to, no. Oh, yeah. I went to the website the week. Um, no, not the week before. A couple of days before. Because I was like, oh, I wonder if everybody's still going to Comic-Con. You know, San Diego Comic-Con. And I was, you know, in a room, in a room with my husband. And I'm scrolling. I said, hon. I said, what? I said, nobody's going to be there. He said, what do you mean? He said, it's a huge convention. I said, well, there are going to be people there. And very talented people. There'll be the artists. And people like that, I said, right, not, no, not writers, but mostly artists. And I said, he said, nobody from Halloween? I said, no. And I think that was supposed to be a big Halloween one, too. Hmm. Yeah. No. And maybe that'll, it'll end here soon for everybody to get, get things back to normal, you know? Yeah, because like I mentioned on my, on my most recent episode, I just did a mini pod, just, you know, only because I also took, uh, July off because of this hot mess of a shoulder. Um, you know, you, you, you can't do panels either. And it's not about the movie stars. I mean, a lot of people say, oh, just go back to work actors. But what they don't realize is that there's like 1% of the people in the union actually can make a living in their acting careers. The rest are people like, you know, background actors or actors who do things sporadically like day player roles where you have a few lines one day in an episode, you know, but for the Tom Cruises and those people, you know, they're the exception to the right. rule of the over 160,000 actors in sag after us. So, you know, they're the exception. So oh, let's hope it's over for the people who do the background, who make the scenes look real, make the cities with people walking around look real because those are not, I don't want to say those are not real people that you see walking around, you know, like in Sex in the City, you see New York City, you see all these people behind them, walking dogs and everything. Those are not your average pedestrian. Those are all paid actors, background actors who get paid, I think, $178 for eight hours of work, you know, which is not shabby. Okay. It's not shabby. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you're treated like cattle. They don't call you by your name. They call you by a number. Mm. You know, so it's different. They're like, number one, number two. I mean, my dog works. My border collie, my fell over. He works on one of the um, law type of shows. And uh, he, because 
I'm an actor in SAG-AFTRA, Doc can't work because I have to handle him. So when he gets what? done again, yeah, I, I, so the I, I'm his handler. I get paid my Screen Actors Guild rate. He gets paid a little stipend. The car gets paid for getting him there. And uh, so he's out of work. <laughs> the dog. <laughs> oh, he's a favorite on one of their shows. He's been on it since he was a puppy. And he's two now. So they've watched him grow on this one show. That's just crazy because you would never even think of anything like that. You know, like yeah. just off the top, like that, that affects like all of that. Yeah. Yeah. Everything. So every, everybody you see in, in um, even Spider-Man movies where you see tons of people on the streets, those are all actors. It's not just somebody going to work or getting lunch, you know? So it's cool. It's cool. Give us the thumbs up. Off you butt. Like, subscribe. And if you subscribe, here's something else you can do. Once you subscribe, you can click the bell notification, right? And it'll notify you anytime that Dead Pit puts up new shit. Or don't. I really don't give a <laughs> if you do. Or I want you to. I want you to. <laughs> I don't let's, care. Let's keep our community growing here on no, YouTube. I don't, I don't like it. I don't want you to touch nothing. Listen, they need to do that, pal. No, don't you dare yeah. touch it. Thumbs up subscribe and click that bell there's all kinds of wonderful shirts over at shop.deadpit.com simply the best horror shirts on t public there are others but they all suck you can get some dead pit radio shirts you can get last south on the left the hills have eyes texas chainsaw oh wait you can't say texas chainsaw all kinds of shirts, folks. You're going to love them. Shop.deadpit.com Thank you to all of our supporters on Patreon. Deadpit on Patreon.com is the only place to check out a complete archive of the old Dead Pit radio shows all the way back from 2005 on, in addition to the midweek shows, fan commentaries, exclusive podcasts, and much more. Dead Pit on Patreon.com if you're interested. Tears start at only $1.